Hello, I am Perox Master 1819. This is my very squeaky chair. Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, and this is the Codex Part Five. We are currently on the Andromeda Species Outlaws section. Uh, I apologise if I yawn during this. I have been recording previous, and I'm a little tired. But I do have tea, so I should be okay. Um, okay, we shall begin. Outlaws Agent. Salarians have always operated at the very cutting edge of technology, believing that anything less is a waste of cap waste of capabilities. Waste of their capabilities. Getting off to a good start. The Salarians who have chosen to become outlaws are no less exacting. Preferring to operate on the sidelines rather than leading an assault, they often deploy holographic decoys bastards. While the decoy cannot damage an enemy, its kinetic barrier generator means that enemy targeting computers will register an impact when it's shot. This forces enemies to divide their attention and allow the Salarian agent to flank or escape. Apex has attempted to research these decoys for large scale deployment against the Ket, but have been unable to create a convincing thermal signature. Meanwhile, it can be expected that the Salarian agents will continue to refine their work. Bastards. Salarian. Oh no, the Adi. Adi are four legged life forms sighted on multiple worlds across the Helios cluster. Often foraging, to foraging together in packs, they are extremely intelligent and capable of understanding complex commands. Wandering explorers and mercenaries are often accompanied by one or two trained Adi for defence. When attacking, Adi drive opponents out of secure positions to make them vulnerable to gunfire or a concerted attack by the rest of the pack. Their jaw, jaw strength has been measured in excess of 1,900 newtons, dangerous even when wearing a hard suit. Adi also show no fear of scout rovers. Interestingly, the Adi genome shows signs of extensive genetic engineering that resembles the uplifting of some domestic animals on Earth before gene modification laws were put in place. These adaptations allow the Adi to survive in hazardous environments and may account for their almost tactical intelligence given even in the wild. Outlaws Berserker Centuries ago, in the Milky Way, Krogan Berserkers served a key role in the Krogan Rebellions as frontal assault forces that cleared enemy dreadnoughts and besieged fortified positions. The battle cry of the famed Ravanak Ravank Berserker Company was so distinctive and psychologically effective that it was often used in propaganda broadcasts. Today, Krogan, who have joined outlaw bands, claim to have revived Berserker tactics. Wielding powerful flak cannons, they bombard positions to intimidate enemies into breaking their line before closing in. When provoked, a Berserker goes into the blood rage that gives them their name, losing higher brain function and the ability to feel pain while unleashing devastating strikes that can snap an enemy's spine in one blow. Ow! The Saboteur. Most of the sighted outlaw forces are composed of forces from the Milky Way, but many Angara have also joined them, either out of disillusionment with the resistance or their own personal glory. This has been heralded with fascination by Nexus social psychologists, who claim it demonstrates universal values and goals between sentient life. And confirmed and concern by Apex, who now who now have to contend with outlaws who have expert knowledge of Helios cluster. Ah, bugger, that's hot. <laughs> um, okay. The light armour and weapons of Angaran outlaws have been fatally deceptive to many Apex squads. When necessary, the Angara act as saboteurs, using their innate control over electromagnetism to drain enemy shield capacitors and boost their own equipment. With combatants, combatants suddenly, be, suddenly vulnerable, they are easy prey for the saboteur or their allies. So basically, they're like leeches. The outlaw sharpshooter. Equipped with custom modified sniper rifle, sharpshooters accompany raiding parties as scouts and long range combatants. 
A well-trained sharpshooter can pick off an unprepared explorer before they even know there are enemies nearby. The skill of many of these sharpshooters is, ironically, the result of initiative colonist defence training before leaving the Milky Way. Strategically, it was believed that well-armed snipers would be simple but effective defenders of their outposts, with a lowered risk of losing personnel in the event of an attack. It appears that training has now been passed along. Pariah. Even without military training, rogue Asari are exceptionally dangerous, as their natural biotic talents mean they are never truly disarmed. These pariahs, now sighted in outlaw bands, wield their powers in pursuit of, in pursuit, in pursuit of blunt plunder and the glory. Sorry, my lip just went a bit. Okay, not as hot. Pariah's attack at short range with shotguns designed for Asari commando forces wearing down kinetic barriers in preparation for a biotic focused attack. For more persistent enemies, many pariahs have mastered a deadly backlash technique, gener generating a shield with near negative mass that accelerates incoming projectiles back at their foes. Interesting. The Hydra. The strange technologies of the Helios Cluster offer many outlaw and exile groups opportunity rather than scientific mystery. With access to black market salvage, remnant technology and stolen gear from the Andromeda Initiative, some have crafted non-standard but highly effective battle mech suits nicknamed Hydras. Most Hydra units are armed with a chain gun and a devastating laser-guided RPG volley, pinning down enemies before bombarding them with heavy fire. Unapproved jump jet designs and a mass lowering element zero core assisting ground clearance or leaping as target. The sheer weight and impact of the Hydra unit can crush enemies or force them to fall back. Apex officially classifies a Hydra unit as a priority zero threat, though unofficial communications often use the acronym BFM. BFM. Bloody fine mess. Von Sloan Kelly. Before her appointment as director of Nexus Security, Sloan served in the Alliance but was discharged after punching a spirit officer for bu bureaucratic bullshit. I like Sloan. She's good. She's not so good if she's on the enemy team, but she's good. Some of the initiatives. Senior leadership had concerns about Sloan's temper, but former director Jean Garson admired Sloan's passion and believed her frank attitude and resourcefulness would ultimately keep the Nexus safer than someone who can, who, who ran things by the book. Duran Tan felt differently. Relationships between Sloan and the new initiative director, while never good, quickly deteriorated during the uprising. Sloan was vehement. Vehem vehemently against using the Krogan against the mutineers and took it personally when the director went behind her back to make a deal with Clan Nackmore. Upon learning of the director's in intervention, Sloane switched sides and joined the rebellion. Although the uprising ultimately failed, Sloane gained legendary status among the exiles and amassed a group of followers called the Outcasts. After leaving the Nexus, Sloan travelled across Helios to Kadara Port, where she defeated an, in, an invaded Ket force and set herself and the outcasts up as the ruling powers on the planet. With Reyes Vidal gone, Sloan remains the de facto ruler of Kadara Port. However, this seems to have brought little peace of mind to Sloan, who is using all available resources to hunt down Reyes and any other members of the Collective. Speaking of Reyes, Reyes Vidal. Like many exiles, Reyes Vidal's screening interviews and personnel records were corrupted during the mutiny on the Nexus. Internal staffing emails show he was a pilot assigned to shuttle N503 callsign Anubis. But beyond that, very little is known about Reyes's life before arriving in Andromeda. Since the Nexus uprising, Reyes has made a name for himself as a smuggler working out of Kadara port. While most, ex while most exiles on Kadara feel pressured to choose between joining the outcasts or the collective to be successful, Reyes proudly claims to be a free agent and even does jobs for the Angara resistance. 
despite being known as a reliable smuggler who always gets the job done, Rez is notoriously bad about paying his bar tabs with the exception of Tartarus, where it's rumoured he has worked out a deal with Kian, the owner. After we thwarted the, after we thwarted the collective's coup on Kadara Port, Rez has been on the run from Sloan Kelly. Outlaw Raider. The Outlaw Band... The outlaw bands of the Helios Cluster are diverse. Some were individuals who joined the Andromeda Initiative as an escape from the Milky Way. Some were exiled after the Nexus Uprising. Others chose to seek their fortune elsewhere. Most of these individuals survived by raiding outposts or wandering exploration teams. While not particularly organised or well equipped, these raiders present a risk to undefended colonists. Most prefer to extort supplies and equipment rather than risk themselves, but when provoked or desperate, they would resort to deadly force. The Outlaws Anarchist. Turians, running with outlaw bands, have turned their mandatory military training to less noble purposes. They override the safeties on ex military hardware to handle a higher explosive yield. Result of, resulting in deadly inferno grenades that leave the thermite deposits on the ground after impact. The thermite can cling to armour and cause massive injuries. Apex, Apex's larger Turian volunteer force takes a dim view of these anarchists, seeing them as not only a threat but an affront to the Turian values of honour and service. Those who cannot be forced to surrender are hunted ruthlessly, though this has only driven anarchists to ever greater feats of military engineering. I like the shotgun. I don't know what shotgun it is, but I like it. Outlaws, outcasts. Cast out for criminal behaviour or their actions during the uprising. Exiles from the Nexus are no longer welcome at the station or initiative outposts. Some have found a new home at Kadara Port, choosing to fight under Sloan Kelly's banner and embracing their title as outcasts. The malicious threat assessment lists the outcasts as a significant risk. Their particular animosity for the Nexus, honed by Sloan Kelly's security expertise, makes them a constant concern for the Nexus leadership. The outcasts harass trade convoys, raid ore and ice transports, and pick off scout teams for their weapons and equipment. There is no simple answer to stopping the outcasts. Goddard Report is defended against Apex Assault, and Sloan Kelly has weathered numerous assassination attempts, retaliating against the Nexus each time. Meanwhile, every individual who must be exiled from the station is a potential outcast recruit. The Remnant. Oh, there's a lot here. <clears throat> Hang on a minute, let me just... <sighs> loosen up my own vocal cords. La 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 la! <clears throat> A remnant interfacing. Remnant technology requires careful reactivation dubbed interfacing, a process Alec Ryder and I first developed on Habitat 7. Using glyphs, dense data packets of remnant code, a working understanding of their language, <coughs> and the interface capabilities of a Pathfinder implant, I can help you trigger or control remnant technology from appropriate locations. <sighs> Interfacing is the only way to activate certain remnant technologies such as monoliths. Scans and surface damage suggest that the Keta repeatedly attempted to activate these sites by other increasingly desperate methods without success. It is not clear whether remnant technology is designed to be activated by an AI. There is no evidence of artificial intelligence in the remnant structures investigated thus far, and the remnant bots have only rudimentary programming. However, the Glyphs contain recognition keys analogues to an electroencephalogram EEG, implying that the system is designed to handle a form of neural input. Data core. The box that PB found in the vault on EO appears to be a remnant data storage device. PB causes a data core and has dedicated her time to unlocking its secrets, as she is convinced that it may contain more information about the remnant builders. Close observation has revealed that security circuitry found within PB's relic boxes often matches up to security found deep in observers and other remnant creations. It is possible that they were used to deliver command routines to remnant machines. POC Proof of concept. Uh, after months of studying and tinkering with the remnant <coughs> sorry. 
<coughs> no sugar in that. Uh, PV was able to strip out an observer's operating protocols using remnant technology found in the vault on EOS along with other pieces scrounged from ruins. Could you not talk while I'm talking, please? There are the ladders outside. Uh, she has discovered how to program the observer to obey her commands. This is POC, proof of concept, a remnant observer that now works for PV. POC has no combat capabilities. It apparently exists for PV's amusement and perhaps companionship. But she has repeated her work and created a combat-ready version that can be deployed in the field. For ease of discerning between the two, this combat model is named Zap. POC was stolen by Kalinda Terev, but has now been recovered and repaired. It is fun functioning normally in PB's service. PB's success in merging remnant and Milky Way technologies is very promising, and she has begun to apply the principles involved to other systems, including those on the Tempest. Remnant creators. The Jardan are a mysterious species or faction responsible for building the bots and technology known as the Remnant. According to recordings and findings from Kartasara, Kaitasara, they were interested in not only were wide-scale terraforming but the creation of sentient life. One of their successful creations, the Angara, were seeded on multiple worlds in the Helios Cluster. The Jardan's motivations for this creation are still unknown. Their work has disrupted, was disrupted by the de deployment of the Scourge weapon, the result of either an external threat or a rift in Jardan society. This weapon devastated the worlds that the Jardan had cultivated and forced them to leave the Helios Cluster, though not before disengaging Meridian and sending it to safety. The present whereabouts and disposi disposition of the Jardan are not known. Whether they will return to Helios remains to be seen. Remnant Breacher. Created by assemblers, these breaches are levitating drones that move in rapid aggressive bursts using a powerful microthruster. PB claims to have named them Breachers after mistaking one for an observer and quickly realising the new example broke the rules. Analysis of Breacher debris shows that their systems are fundamentally unstable. Their power cores are improperly shielded and many of their inner workings are exposed, which I'm guessing is the little the, the, the bit at the front. Uh, this suggests that they are created for short-term deployment to handle intruders who stray into remnant territory, and in turn offers some insight into the remnant builder's military doctrine. Combined with single-minded programming that focuses on hostiles, the volatile construction of breaches makes them extremely dangerous. If provoked, the breacher will launch itself at an opponent and attempt to latch onto it, using exposed gears to grind through hard suits and cause severe damage. When damage will be on repair, a breacher may trigger its power core to overload and self-destruct. Decryption. Most remnant technology is inert or in a standby mode, but some is secured with a decryption grid or a Sudoku. Unlocking it requires scanning the correct remnant glyphs and arranging them in a specific order. The glyphs, glyphs. The glyphs cannot repeat on any straight line or within a square block of four. PB speculates this could be a safety measure. Even if a method was devised to brute force hack an interface, it would not work with the decryption grid. Given the devastating consequences when remnant technology is improperly activated, her analysis seems sound. The arrangement of the glyphs appears to be complete either appears to complete either a password or a code phrase within the grid as a whole. From the little I understand of the remnant language, they appear to form an almost palindromic SATA square sentence. But the finer meaning would require detailed explanation from the grid's designer. Remnant destroyer. These bastards. Destroyers are heavy weapon platforms deployed against the most determined intruders into remnant territory. Armed with a directed energy cannon and two secondary laser turrets that can engage multiple targets simultaneously, a single destroyer can take out an entire combat squad in minutes. When asked why she named it a destroyer, PB folded her arms, rolled, it up, rolled her eyes and answered, you figure it out. One of the most disconcerting characteristics of the destroyer is its 
partitioned power system. Destroying one of its turrets means the power is automatically diverted to its locomotion systems, allowing it to move much faster. Many individuals have mistakenly believed they could pick off a destroyer's turrets from a distance and evade it safely, only to have a destroyer close that distance unexpectedly. This often has fatal consequences, since at melee range the destroyer transfers power to an electromagnetic burst that causes severe damage to any individuals unlucky enough to be close. Apex has reported variants of the destroyer that have a self-repair network for their turrets. These destroyers can briefly go dormant, transferring full power to fix any damage before reactivating its turrets again. Few have been sighted, but engagement is not recommended. I don't think we've come across one of those, thankfully. The Remnant Nullifier. This remnant model appears to have been designed for excavation. If provoked, it enters a siege mode where it aggs itself to the ground and launches explosive projectiles at a target. In this mode, this remnant constantly ruins a self-repair cycle, reducing damage from incoming fire. PB claims that this characteristic is what earned it the name Nullifier. Recovery of Nullifier parts has been illuminating. They use both balancing pythons and dense ferrofluid reservoirs in their lower extremities to remain stable while firing. Design characteristics that could be useful for initiative mining operations. Their blast shielding is also surprisingly light for its thickness, 72mm and density. The plates are cushioned by a honeycomb of shock absorbing polymer to distribute any ballistic force. However, these characteristics are also what allows them to absorb heavy fire and act as formidable opponents. Remnant Assembler. Remnant assemblers were nicknamed for their ability to create smaller units known as breaches. Each assembler contains a reservoir of an unknown ferrofluid similar to Omnigel, which can be used to 3D print breaches on the spot with alarming speed. Tactically, assemblers focus on manufacturing reinforcements, moving to safe distances during combat. If approached while in its hostile mode, the assembler can jettison the partially completed power core of a breacher, which acts like an explosive grenade causing massive damage to enemies and allowing the assembler to withdraw. Upon creating a breacher, the assembler transfers a full copy of its stored recent memory and battlefield disposition to the new remnant, ensuring it is a combat ready or ensuring it is combat ready almost immediately. This capability means the assembler is constantly branching and partitioning its memory in preparation without loss without loss of data. An interesting an interesting characteristic that may be useful in future 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 artificial intelligence designs. Remnant kernel device. Found in a defunct remnant manufacturing center in the heart of an active volcano, this device is unique amongst amidst the remnant technology discovered to date. It appears to contain a remnant programming kernel, which would offer unprecedented insight into how remnant technology performs, seeming Im- seemingly impossible feats. PB has expressed her determination to study the device and find ways to analyse it. She believes on strong evidence that the device can facilitate her attempts to merge remnant technology with our own. PB and Gil have been successful in utilising the device to augment Tempest systems and enhance your ability to control remnant vessels in the battle to take Meridian. The device's potential to unlock how the remnant acquire programming and evolve our ability to interface and appropriate a remnant hardware and systems is unparalleled. PB's research could lead to impressive advances in years to come. The remnant. Sorry, I had an itchy nose. Remnant is the umbrella term coined for technology structures and autonomous bots that have been sighted across the Helios cluster. Seemingly abandoned by whoever created it, this remnant technology is extremely advanced, but most of it is in a standby state. On Habitat 7, Alec Ryder discovered that reactivating this technology requires scanning glyphs. Data packets written in remnant coding language and my assistance with interfacing at particular consoles. This is complicated by remnant bots, 
that still guard and maintain many of these installations. Remnant bots do not appear to be sentient, but they are programmed to consider any interface with the technology as a hostile act and act single mind and attack single mindedly. The cat have an interest in remnant technology and have been sighted across this cluster, attempting to study or control sites where it is still active. Evidence suggests the cat have not yet developed this reliable method of interfacing. Investigations at Key Tsaira reveal that the remnant were built by a species or faction known as the Jardan. This technology was intended to foster life like the Jardan had created, using the vaults to manage planetary ecology strictly controlled from a central point known as Meridian. The scourge destroyed the connection from Meridian to these vaults and deactivated many of the Jardan's technological creations. The Jordan left the cluster soon afterwards for an unknown, lo unknown location, leaving their technology behind as remain remnants of their civilization in Helios. The Remnant Observer. Squiddy! Observers mid to long range remnant drones can be seen at most remnant sites. They are equipped with element zero cores that allow them to levitate and can normally be seen scanning or conducting maintenance at these sites. While they are released for a bust of the remnant bots, observers are still a threat to unprepared explorers if provoked. Examination of destroyed remnant observers shows they have multiple sensor vectors, visual, oral, electromagnetic and others as yet unidentified, undefined, and a comprehensive toolkit of equipment for observation and maintenance during an ultraviolet, including an ultraviolet beam laser. Serving partially as its primary weapon, the frequencies of an, observer's, of an observer's laser appear to react with remnant structures to induce a repair cycle. Observers are also capable of bringing other remnants online, likely as part of their maintenance duties. When asked, PV explains the name observers with everywhere you go, they seem to be looking at you. <laughs> oh, of course. Sorry, something in my eye. Yeah, I might get this done today, it might not. A remnant abyssal. After several months, the Nexus has received numerous unconfirmed reports of a huge remnant construct in the Elodon dunes. It is said to patrol a certain area of the desert, diving through the sand seemingly unimpeded and attacking intruders with overwhelming force. As no trace of such a construct has been found, and these witnesses are often found to be suffering from heat stroke, the Nexus is currently dismissing these claims as a white whale myth. Those who believe the report refer to these constructs as abyssals. If the reports are in fact accurate, the question arises as to the abyssal's purpose. Such a construct might be used to extract and process valuable resources from the sand, using the kinetic pumping action to power it. Alternately, the abyssal might be using might be used as a defensive measure for sensitive locations. Regardless, the reports or reports all state that the abyssal is impervious to weapons and indifferent to communications, suggesting that if it actually exists, this construct would be best studied at a distance. Planets and locations. Yeah. Yeah. The planet known as Habitat 7 was one of the Golden Worlds, selected by the Andromeda Initiative for early settlement. Signs pointed to a lush and biologically diverse tropical region that could easily support an outpost. With, an, with, with no communications from the Nexus or sister arcs upon arrival in the Helios Cluster, the Hyperion approached Habitat 7 to begin survey and settlement operations as soon as possible, but even visual assessments showed that the planet was no longer viable. Habitat 7 is now a storm-wracked world with an unbreathable argon-nitrogen atmosphere. Intense magnetic activity in unknown metallic elements interacts with the storms, causing interesting but highly destructive electrical phenomena, i.e. fucking really, really bad lightning. The investigating Pathfinder team encountered hostile alien life and strange technology on the surface. Reactivating this technology caused a noticeable change in the conditions in Habitat 7. However, the planet is still unsuitable for settlement, and the resulting activation ultimately claimed the life of Alex Ryder, the human pathfinder. Elodin. Elodin is the scorching desert moon of a gas giant, identified on initiative charts as Habitat 2. 
Helidon was considered a golden world despite, it, despite its harsh conditions because of the moon's vast mineral wealth. Tidal gravitational effects caused plumes of sodium silicate to erupt from Elodon's core, depositing unusually pure silicon sand across the surface, invaluable for manufacturing high-performance computer hardware. Mm-hmm. Orbital surveys show that contrary to projections, Elodon is almost devoid of water vapour, making long-term settlement or mining efforts unlikely. Those who live on Elodon face a constant struggle for survival, able to thrive in environments that would kill most organic species in days. The Krogan who departed the Nexus have established a colony on Elodon and defended their sovereignty, sovereignty fiercely. Aomani. The Nexus advises travellers to avoid Elodon if possible. After a gift of a valuable remnant drive core, the Krogan colony of New Tuchunka is now allied with the initiative. Overlord Morda shares leadership with the initiative's assigned representative, Kuriste Arcana. The Nexus is gathering a negotiation team to draw up mineral and water claims on Elodin. There is no data on whom the Krogan are choosing as negotiators. The activated remnant vault has increased the presence of cloud forming particulates in Elodin's sky. Though the moon is still brutally hot, moisture levels have notice- noticeably risen. Increasing ambient humidity and the likelihood of rain. The next scientists advise that the inhabitants of Elodon, once starved, of, starved for water, should prepare for flash floods. How many things are on here? No, oh, right, okay. Haval. As Jarl, as Jarl explains, it, explains, Haval is considered the ancestral home of the Angara. The ruins of Angara cities are a, are a draw for researchers, looters, and Angara who defy the Ket to make pilgrimage. The planet's history also makes it a symbolic staging ground for the ruth- ruthlessly xenophobic Rokar. <clears throat> Long-range surveys by the Andromeda Initiative indicated Haval was a golden world of lush green jungles and abundant liquid water. The planet was considered a golden world and given the label Habitat 3. So we've got three, 2, 3 and 7. Now... Two, three, seven. Our observations today show Haval is unrecognisable. The jungles now dominate much of the planet's surface, demonstrating bizarre growth patterns. Samples show grotesque mutations and hormonal changes in the jungle's plant life, rendering it not only extremely hardy but hazardous for consumption. These factors point to a large-scale shift in Haval's ecology that bears investigation. With the remnant vault stabilised and correctly activated, both Angoran and Nexus scientists report a noticeable improvement in Haval's plant life. The more aggressive and mutated species are dying back, supplanted by soil enriching and pollinating varieties. In a comparatively brief time, Haval shows signs of being a welcome garden world. Welcoming Golden World. Meanwhile, initiative scientists have joined forces with Angoran personnel to investigate Haval further. The Scourge. That's a wonderful picture. The Scourge is the co- colloquial term for a huge and extremely dangerous interstellar phenomenon sight- sighted across much of the Helios Cluster. It appears to be a cloud spreading in tendrils that affect planets and surrounding space, destroying starships that attempt to pass through it, through or near it. Observations and data from the Nexus now show the Scourge's tendrils are composed of radioactive element zero rich dust and debris. Within these tendrils, thousands of micros- microscopic and unstable warps in space-time are constantly erupting. These unpredictable distortions build up a charge in the ESO, causing uncontrolled mass effects that alter gravity and can rip a starship apart without warning. The Scourge's presence also affects nearby planets, raining down radioactive fallout and debris, or even altering the orbit of worlds that pass through or near it. The Scourge is relative is aggressively drawn to remnant structures on planets. Though the cause of the attraction is not yet fully understood, this manifests as further tendrils of dust and radioactive particulates that cling to the surface of remnant technology and interfere with its operations. Either this matter was left behind after the planet in question passed through the Scourge itself, or even distant interactions with remnant technology could cause the Scourge to coalesce spontaneously. In either case, even this minor manifestation of the Scourge demands additional caution. 
when approaching remnant sites. No long range data showed any signs of the scourge before departing to the Helios cluster. Div Nexus scientists suggest it may have appeared in the intervening centuries while the Arcs travelled to Andromeda. So now we now know the scourge is the fallout of a weapon detonated at Key Tisari. Tis Tisara. I'm going to get that one wrong every time. Dr. Aridana believes the weapon caused an instantaneous cluster-wide warping of space-time, briefly connecting multiple points in the Helios cluster at once. Her model suggests the warp effect annihilated multiple planets, forming the debris in the Scourge's tendrils, while the resulting radiation converted much of that debris to element zero. As we have seen, the space-time warping effect continues on a micro-scale within the Scourge to this day. Aya. Aya is an anomaly in the Helios Cluster, a lush planet where a remnant site appears to be active. It is a sanctuary for the Angara, the only known sentient species local to Helios, and guarded fiercely against outsiders. This is... Ow! That was my wrist, if you heard that. Ooh. This is helped by Aya's position relative to Helios' black hole. Its gravitational lensing effect makes Aya harder to detect. The scourge also makes the approach to Aya extremely dangerous for untrained pilots. Scans indicate numerous Ket wrecks lost in the scourge nearby, picked clean by Ankaru salvages. Aya is also the headquarters of the Angara resistance movement against the Ket. I think that video was about 37. Sorry, I pressed. Um, I have my start and stop recording as my plus and minus on my number pad and I misclicked it when I was um, tried to mute myself from yawning it didn't work so I pressed negative so I've got to figure out what the fuck I'm doing uh, Aya is also the headquarters of the Angara resistance movement against the Ket whose leaders advise Aya's planetary governor Paran Shai director Tan has ordered the, uh, that Aya is not only to be considered sovereign territory but a military power while the Tempest and, it, Tempest, Tempest and its crew were allowed to visit peacefully, the Nexus is advising extreme caution to other potential visitors and ordering the distribution of early contact guidelines. With relations warming between the Initiative and the Angara, diplomatic overtures continue. The Initiative is opening an embassy on Aya with Panashai's approval while extending invitations to Angaran diplomats and scientists to tour the Nexus. Our cultural exchange is beginning several cooperative programs intended to foster better understanding between the various Milky Way species and the Angara. The Andromeda Galaxy Located 2.5 million light years from the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy is the largest galaxy in the local group, also, cat also categorised as M31. Andromeda is a spiral galaxy roughly 220,000 light years in diameter, containing approximately 1 trillion stars, compared to the Milky Way's 300 billion. The Helios Cluster is a large star cluster located on the galaxy's outer fringe. Oh, right. Okay. Well, now we know where it is. Andromeda, ha Andromeda has roughly 14 satellite galaxies which orbit the large, which orbit the galactic disk. Evidence shows a disturbance where one of these companion galaxies, M32, passed through Andromeda's spiral arm several million years ago. Andromeda itself is also accelerating towards the Milky Way at roughly 100 kilometers per second. In roughly 4 billion years, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies will collide and merge, forming a new galactic disk. We're going to be long gone when that happens. As well as recording. Probably a lot of everything else as well. But yeah, that's depressing. Uh, that was thirty four six plus five is eleven. I don't know.
There's that. So I fucking confused myself. Um, evidence in the Eye of Vault shows the network of remnant vaults across the Helios Cluster is controlled from a central point known as Meridian. When properly connected to Meridian, the vaults function as designed, terraforming and maintaining planetary conditions to make planets suitable for life. When disconnected, the vaults appear to either go into standby, as seen on EOS, or malfunction, as may have happened on Habitat 7, with disastrous consequences for that planet. This Meridian this proves Meridian's central importance to remnant vaults and the planets of the Helios Cluster. Whoever controls it can theoretically affect vault function, meaning they could control or disrupt the ecology of entire worlds. Following the Archon's data led to a gigantic remnant structure he had codenamed Key to Syrah. God fucking I'm gonna get that wrong every time. I have to. The Archon believe this to be Meridian when it is actually just a command core. Records that Kai Tassara Kai Tassira show Meridian itself was jettisoned to safety when its builders faced the weapon with cr which created the scourge. Meridian is a construct akin to a Dyson sphere, a vast hollow shell encompassing a power source that provides heat and light to lush green biomes in the interior. My early studies of Jodan records suggest Meridian was their laboratory and seed world, connecting to each vault and constantly monitoring the progress of life there. However, even at quantum processing speeds, it will take decades to sift through all of Meridian's accumulated data. With the Hyperion crash landed inside, humanity has a significant stake in Meridian's future and has founded Port Meridian, a largely human settlement, human, human settlement based around the Hyperion's crash site. Speaking of Port Meridian, Port Meridian. Meridian is now the name of both the Jardin Seed World Shell and the largely human port and city within. The, arch arch the architectural centre of the port is the repurposed superstructure of the Arc Hyperion, which is being converted to stationary housing and research facilities. The controlled crash of the Hyperion by Captain Nozomi Dunn mark the first complete deployment and landing of an initiative arc in Andromeda, effectively designating Meridian a human capital. Adaptation of the former Ark Harperian is ongoing, as is the deployment of its 20,000 sleepers. H047C This small planet was of particular interest to the Turing contingent of the Andromeda initiative. Long distance studies suggested H 047C was a golden world, eminently suitable for dextro protein species like Turians, earning it the designated, earning it the designation Habitat Five. So we're missing one, four, and six so far. Uh, the Turian arctic data set course for H047C to ensure they would have a viable settlement site on arrival. In the intervening centuries, astron astronomical studies show that H047C was pulverized there was pulverized by debris from the erupting scourge. The dark energy of the phenomenon increased the mass of this debris to the point that the impact shattered the planet, leaving it uninhabitable. With its magnetic field drastically weakened and much of its atmosphere lost, what remains intact of H047C's surface is vulnerable to cosmic radiation. This has rendered the soil unable to support life, though it is a potential source of valuable helium-3, which is where we put the remnant tiller to work. Rider 1. The planet formerly known as Habitat 7 was one of the Golden Worlds, selected by the Andromeda Initiative for early settlement. The first attempt to land there came at great cost, including the life of then Pathfinder Alec Rider. By now, as a result of the perseverance of his daughter, the current human Pathfinder, the initiative is returning to the planet. Pathfinder Rider has achieved viability across Helios, gaining the resources for extraordinary efforts here. And to honour their achievement, the world has been renamed Rider 1. Rider 2. 
Rider 1 remains storm wrecked with intense magnetic activity. The random vault on the planet is still non functional, and restoring the network influence of Meridian has not changed that. But vault vaults are not the only means of making worlds livable. The Andromeda Initiative has begun traditional terraforming, starting with atmospheric manipulation to alter the climate. It is a lengthy and costly process, one that nearly one that only 100% viability across the cluster has enabled. Rider 1 will be a future golden world developed from the ground up by the people whose children will eventually call it home. Eos. Eos, designated habitat 1. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's 1. We're missing 4 and 6 still. Eos, designated habitat 1, was the earliest golden world identified for outpost placement. Named for the Greek goddess of dawn, by Jane Garson personally, Eos embodied the hope of the Andromeda Initiative for a new start. On arrival, the Nexus discovered that a world projected to be arid but comfortably habitable was now ravaged by radioactive fallout from the Scourge. The planet's atmosphere is racked by storms that have spread the radiation across continents. Periodic 130 km per hour winds strip equipment and damage shuttles. Reports from the Nexus include a sanitised account of two attempts to colonise the planet, both of which ended in failure and an acceptable loss of life. There is, or was, also a significant kept presence on EOS, apparently investigating mysterious signals on the surface. EOS is now off limits to unauthorised personnel from the Nexus, as the Nexus leadership believe it is no longer viable. I switched that around there, but it still made sense. <clears throat> Activating the vault discovered below Eos's surface has had a dramatic and immediate effect. Radioactive particles are being stripped from the atmosphere by unknown, unknown means, and the resulting temperature changes are calming Eos's high winds. The planet's moisture levels are already showing improvement. Prodromos, the first Pathfinder established outpost, has been founded in Fairwinds Basin, with Mayor August Bradley in charge. The Nexus is broadcasting footage of departing colonists and the new conditions on EOS across all communication channels. And before we read about the black hole at the centre of the Helios Cluster, I have been Paradox Master 1819. This has been Mass Effect Andromeda. Be nice to fellow humans. Goodbye.